It's good to see you. I'm um, glad you're here tonight. Uh, but we're just going to go ahead and get right into it. Uh, to be a people that is completely and utterly satisfied in the gospel. To be a people that is completely satisfied in the gospel, that you don't want anything else, that you feel like you can't live without it. You have to start by understanding the gravity of sin. You can't start anywhere else. All right? And if you want to go ahead and turn, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3 tonight. Um, that's where we're going to kind of be mainly. Um, I'm going to hit a few other verses, but you can go ahead and turn there. But to be completely honest with you, this, this was really easy for me to prepare for because this is really what God has been teaching me lately um, in my life and uh, just really showing me. Um, Tyler, if you want to understand the gospel, if you want that to, if you want your life to flow from the gospel, you have to start by understanding the gravity of sin and what it's done to my relationship with you, okay? And so that's what we're going to do tonight. And, and as I say every time that I get up here, um, I want you to put everything aside, um, whatever you came in here with, um, whether it be um, bad relationships or uh, family issues or sickness or maybe even a test coming up. I want you to put all that to the side because what's happening up here is the most important thing. And that's not because I'm up here talking to you. Um, there, there are other people that are more competent um, to talk with you on the issue of the devastation of sin in your life. Um, but basically, the reason I say that is because when we open the word of God, which is what we're about to do, we're essentially saying to God, God, I want you to teach me. I want you to convict me. Do whatever you have to do to help me fall deeper in love with you. That's why this is the most important thing that's happening right now. So, are y'all ready to do that tonight? Are you with me? There we go, there we go. All right, well then, put on your big boy pants and uh, let's, uh, let's get into this. So the gospel is essentially the good news that when Jesus rose from the grave, he defeated sin and death. And as a Christian in here tonight, if you're a Christian and if you believe that, then you believe that everything in your life stems from that fact. No matter what you do, even the littlest thing like eating and drinking, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, stems from that fact that Jesus rose from the grave and he defeated sin and death. He says it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are all of a people most to be pitied. Basically what he's saying is that if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, our faith is worthless. We're still in our sins and we are to be pitied. But sadly, this event, Jesus' death and resurrection, has been reduced in the church to a once a year celebration where we dress up a little bit fancier, all right? I want you to think about it like this. What if tomorrow morning you wake up and you turn on the TV and there's news that the scientists, while you're sleeping, had discovered a cure for cancer, okay? No matter what stage it's in, they've discovered a cure for cancer. Can you imagine the pandemonium, the chaos that would erupt um, across the world. Phone lines would be shut down because people would be trying to call their loved ones. Hey, have you heard the news? Blah, 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 blah. Um, it would be crazy. And the reason for that is because there's really no one in this world that hasn't been touched in one way or another by cancer. So my question to you tonight, as Ashley posed earlier, why do we not celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus in a greater way? I think the answer to this question is what we're going to be getting into tonight is really because many of us, myself included, we fail to grasp the spiritual and physical dev devastation that sin has on our life and on our relationship with God. Because a cure for cancer won't impress you very much if you don't see it as a serious problem. The same is even truer for the death and resurrection of Jesus. Let me say it another way. Jesus' death and resurrection was the greatest solution, the greatest cure, and the greatest rescue that a world that is completely enveloped in sin 
could have ever hoped for or dreamed of. But we cannot cherish it. We cannot cherish it the way that it's meant to be cherished and live completely satisfied in the gospel and let our life stem from that until we see sin for what it really is and what it's done to our lives. And that's ultimately our goal tonight, is to, is to, to see that tonight. So you can go ahead and open up your Bible. Um, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3, like I said. Uh, but first we're going to start off um, in chapter 2. I'm going to look at uh, three verses in chapter 2, 15 through 17. I'm going to read those really quick. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day, or for in the day that you eat of, of it, you shall surely die. So God had given Adam everything, everything, even himself. But he gave him one prohibition, all right? Now, this one guideline, surely it wasn't too hard to follow. I mean, if it was me, not eating fruit is like second nature to me. Like, I can't stand it. Unless it's like a fruit snack, and then I'm, I eat like eight packs in one sitting. Like, I love those things. Um, but eating fruit, that wouldn't be hard for me to do. Um, and so, right off the bat, what we see, and if you're taking notes, this is going to be really important for you to write down. But right off, the, right off the bat, we see that God desires obedient hearts more than he desires obedient hands. Okay? I'm going to say that again. God desires obedient hearts more than he desires obedient hands. See, if God told me to eat, if God told me not to eat the fruit, I could do that 24-7 every single day. But that's basically because I hate fruit. Like I don't want any, I don't don't want anything to do with it. It's not because I want to obey God. It's basically because I don't like fruit. Now, if God, told, if, if God came to me and said, Tyler, I do not want you to go up to that tree of knowledge of good and evil and take off a book that's hanging from that tree and read it, that would be really hard for me to do because those of you who know me, um, you know I love to read. Um, it may almost be an idol in my life. I'm confessing that to you right now. Um, but that would be really hard for me to do. But to eat the fruit, that wouldn't be hard for me because I don't like fruit. And so it's not because I want to obey God, but because I don't like fruit. So God desires obedient hearts more than he desires obedient hands. Our obedience to God should be rooted in trust. The same trust he wanted Adam and Eve to experience within the garden. Now, whether or not you've ever considered this connection um, between the heart and sin, there is someone else who understands this connection and how crucial trust is in the fight against sin, and that someone is Satan, okay? Okay. If he can get us to question God's goodness, then he has us right where he wants us. Now let's jump to chapter 3. Let's look at uh, the first five verses of chapter 3. It says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not, you shall not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. All right. The first thing that the text tells us in, in chapter 3 is what? that the serpent is more crafty, is craftier than any other creature that God has created. It's important to pay attention to this craftiness tonight because it not only shows us what the serpent says, but it also shows us his motivations for why he says it. So with that in mind, let's look at verse 1 again. It says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that every word in Scripture is inspired by God. And this rings true in this first verse of chapter 3 with one subtle word. In some of your uh, translations, it may be the word indeed. It may be the word indeed. You see, this, using this word, Satan isn't denying what God said to Eve. What he's doing is he's mocking God. Basically, he's saying, did God really say you couldn't eat that? How could a being so good and kind 
restrict you from that fruit. But he doesn't stop with mockery. He also twists God's words just enough to fan the flame of doubt in both Adam and Eve. Remember verses 16 and 17. What did he say to them? He said, you can eat of any fruit in the garden except the fruit from the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, what does he say? What does Satan say? He says, did God actually say you shall, eat, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? He's trying to convince them that God's withholding something from them is the same as God withholding everything from them. And honestly, isn't this how we feel sometimes? When we, when we realize God is not letting us have something, that we feel like God's withholding everything from us? You see, one of Satan's greatest weapons is trickery, and he's a master at it. Instead of attacking Adam and Eve with a command, he comes at them with a de deceptive question. You see, your heart must be shifted first, and then your mind will follow it, and you will believe the most blatant lies like Adam and, Adam and Eve did when Satan said, you, sh you shall surely not die. And now that Adam and Eve are wrestling with this possibility that God may not be good, Satan begins to challenge, their, challenge the trustworthiness of God's word. You see, he knows what is most crucial to destroy. He doesn't bring into question God's existence. God's existence is evident all around them. God walks with them. They know God exists. What he brings into question, what he raises the issue with is God's goodness. This is exactly the question that we wrestle with today as a society. We sit there and say, if God is so good, then, then why do people suffer? If God is so good, then why does he allow tragedy to happen? If God is so good, then why do I see injustice everywhere I look? You see, Satan has woven into the subconscious of Adam and Eve that if they obey God, they are missing out on something better. He caused them to be so convinced that they are missing out on something that, as we will see in a minute, humanity eventually loses out on everything. So the triumph of Satan to deceive God's children into doubting his goodness is the root of every evil in the world. Sin is in everyone, everyone in here, myself included, sin is within you. And it is inescapable. You cannot run from it. It's a stain smeared over each and every one of us. And apart from God's intervention, we are trapped in this cycle forever. We are trapped in this cycle forever. So I want you to keep that in mind as we move on to verse 6. Let's look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that, tree was to be de and that the tree was to be a desire to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So when Eve stops seeing God as good, she starts to view the fruit as good. Okay? This is exactly how you and me, how, how, how we live. All right? You see... Guys, the guys in here, when we stop seeing God's plan for us, for our sexuality as good, we start to view things, sexual sins like pornography and sleeping around with as many people as we can as desirable. Girls, when you stop seeing God's plan for your life, his, where you find your, your self-worth in him, and you, when you stop seeing that as good and you start finding your self-worth in your body image and you start finding your self-worth in having a guy on your arm 24-7, no matter who he is or what he, what he does to you, you start to find that more desirable than God. Sin is always masquerading as good. One of my favorite authors, Paul David Tripp, he says it like this. I want you to listen to this quote. He says, sin lives in a costume. That's why it is so hard to recognize. The fact that sin looks so good is one of the things that makes it so bad. In order for it to do its evil work, it must present itself as something that is anything but evil. Life in a fallen world is like attending the ultimate masquerade party. Impatient yelling wears the costume of zeal for the truth. Lust can masquerade as a love for beauty. Gossip does its evil work by living in the costume of concern and prayer. Craving for power and control wears the mask of biblical leadership. Fear of man gets dressed up as a servant's heart. 
The pride of always being right masquerades as a love for biblical wisdom. Evil simply doesn't present itself as evil, which is part of its draw. You'll never understand sin's sleight of hand until you acknowledge that the DNA of sin is deception. Now listen to this. What this means personally is that as sinners, we are all very committed and gifted self-swindlers. We are too skilled at looking at our own wrong and seeing good. We are too skilled at looking at our own wrong and seeing good. So Eve, she's deceived by the mask of sin's goodness and she eats the fruit. Now I want you to look at what Adam's doing in verse six, at the end of verse six. It says here, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Now this isn't a, uh, it's not a shining moment of biblical manhood right here, okay? And I want to pause for a second before I move on, and I want to talk to the fellas really quick. Um, If you're a guy in here tonight, no matter the ministry that you are a part of, no matter what church you go to, it's time to get up off your butt and start serving, okay? Excuse my language. It's time to get off your butt and start being a leader. Excuse my language again, okay? It's time to stop being a burden to your ministry and start being a burden carrier, all right? Now let me move on. You get that one for free, okay? Adam was by Eve's side during the entire pitch. Adam looked on and through an action supported everything that went on. Eve ate and Adam followed. On paper, this seems like such a simple act. It's not like Adam and Eve were going around the garden massacring every single animal that was in the garden, okay? This was such a simple act. It was, it was a small act of disobedience that carried grave consequences. There's another quote from a book that I really, really love. It's called um, uh, A Valley of Vision. It's a, basically a book of Puritan prayers. And one of the quotes in the book says this, let me never forget the heinousness of sin lies not so much in the nature of the sin committed as in the greatness of the person sinned against. Let me say that again in case you didn't hear that. Let me never forget the heinousness of sin lies not so much in the nature of the sin committed as in the greatness of the person sinned against. If you don't hear anything else the rest of the night, catch this. This is why sin is so horrible, no matter how big or how small it is. Think of all the seemingly small sins that you commit every single day but you write off is not a big deal because they don't have an effect on you. You see, we think our efforts should be focused on getting rid of the bigger sins in our life first. But that that viewpoint, that is completely and utterly inaccurate and it's not what the Bible tells us. Sin isn't severe because of the effect it has on your life. Sin is severe because of the greatness of who it offends. When we sin, even in small, seemingly harmless ways, we offend the greatest, most powerful person to ever enter into the landscape of history and who created it all, God. You see, the sin that started it all was was an act of disobedience to God's command. What was the consequence of that sin? Let's look at that right now. Let's look at verses seven through 10. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and he said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were, oh, sorry, that was verse 11. Let's stop at verse 10. Um, They now knew, Adam and Eve now knew evil experientially. They realized that they were naked. They, They realized evil and all of its guilt, shame, and misery. Their eyes had been opened and they saw that they were naked. They, they made clothes out of fig leaves to hide their nakedness. And then God comes looking for them and they, He comes looking for them so they hide so God couldn't see their nakedness. But my question to you is what happened 
from before they sinned to now for them to realize they were naked because they had always been naked. So why was it such a big deal to them now? Well, before they had sinned, their nakedness didn't bother them because they had felt clothed. They had felt clothed. God's goodness, they were covered in God's goodness. That's why they felt clothed. At the heart of all this, we see that sin was a great exchange that Adam and Eve made. The clothing of God's goodness, his acceptance, his glory, and his purity is what enabled them to stand before God without shame and without guilt. Now the thought of being fully known is horrifying to them. It scares me how much I can relate to this. If everyone in here really understood the depths of my heart and the filthiness and the ugliness and just the, how gross it is, I guarantee you there wouldn't be a single person in here tonight. Why would you want to come listen to me? Why would you want to come to this place and I'm up here speaking if you really understood and knew my heart? You see, we spend the majority of our day trying to cover our nakedness and present our acceptable version of ourself. For example, and please don't raise your hand because I don't want to know it would really gross me out. But how many of you, when you go to the restroom, realize no one's in there? You know where I'm headed. You go to the restroom and realize no one's in there, so you leave without washing your hands. Then you go back again, and there's someone in there, so you wash your hands this time because you don't want them to know how filthy you are. But sadly, trying to cover ourselves is a waste of time. Even after Adam and Eve broke communion with God, they still needed him for sufficient covering. Look at verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and he clothed, he, he clothed them. Out of God's goodness, the goodness that Adam and Eve had failed to trust in, God gave them a more durable and protective covering than fig leaves could ever imagine doing. Now, please do not miss the fact that these clothes that God made for them were made out of skin, okay? They were made out of skin. Blood had to have been shed for God to cover them. What this is, is this is a foreshadowing of what is to come with Jesus' death and with Jesus' death, his atoning death on the cross. <clears throat> God covered his children with clothing, but eventually he would cover them in righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Just like he says in 1 Corinthians 1.30. He says, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now I want to look at one other consequence in this, in this chapter. Let's look at verses 22 through 24. It says this, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which, he had from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and the east of the garden, or he, and, he, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. You see, they had been banished from the garden. It's gone from bad to worse. This is where we see the greatest result of the fall. You see, prior to their rebellion, Adam and Eve had walked freely with God together in the garden. But by listening to the serpent, they, they had lost that communion. All right? And God places cherubim outside the garden with a sword that is going in a circle to protect the entrance from, from anyone getting in. Now, we have become God's enemies, and the guard's presence indicates the impossibility of a human-initiated reestablishment of a relationship with God. What this means is never again, on our own, can we enter into the state of Eden. No matter how many fig leaves we sow together, no matter how much we bedazzle them and make them look pretty, by doing community service, by feeding the hungry, by clothing the poor. No matter what we do to make our fig leaves look pretty, we'll never be able to get into that state again on our own. 
I want you to let that sink in for a minute because a lot of us, we try so hard sometimes to get back into God's graces after we sin. We try so hard to do whatever we can to make ourselves look better. Here's, here's really how I want to kind of bring this to a close tonight. It's been a pretty dark journey in this chapter up to this point. We've basically found out that sin is horrendous. And, it, it, and it's because it offends the greatest person to ever enter, ever enter into the landscape of history, God. And there is absolutely nothing we can do to fix that or make that relationship right. But here's the thing, I have some great news for you tonight. If we are ever, if we are ever to get back into the, a, a right relationship with God, if we are ever to commune with God again, it is up to him to fix that. And that is precisely what the rest of the Bible is about. Genesis 3.24 that we just read, it seems like a pretty dark verse. God's kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden and he's put a, a, a cherubim there an angel with a sword turning, a flaming sword turning round and round so no one can get back in. But here's what that verse does not say. It does not say that a way back into the garden is not possible. In fact, it says completely the opposite of that. The only way for us to get back to the place where we can trust God's goodness again is if someone risks going through the sword of fire for us. And amazingly, someone has done that already. The flaming sword of God fell on Jesus the the day that he hung on the cross. His sacrifice, which was the ultimate and perfect covering, no longer was it fig leaves or animal skins, it was Christ's blood shed on the cross, is what reopened that entrance for us and enables us to commune with God again. At the cross, Jesus undid everything that went wrong in Genesis chapter 3. In the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve, Obey me concerning the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and you will live. In another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, God told Jesus, Obey me concerning this tree of crucifixion, and you will die. You see, Adam and Eve disobeyed, but Jesus obeyed. Eve took and ate of the tree and a simple act of of disobedience gave way to a world of chaos that they could never have even imagined. And in preparation for the cross, Jesus tells his disciples, and I want you to listen to this, because think of what sent this world into chaos. It was the simple act of eating. And in preparation for the cross, Jesus tells his disciples, take and eat. This is my body that is broken for you. This is my blood that is shed for you. You see, this meal, it symbolized Christ's ultimate act of obedience and made way for us to once again commune with our Father. So where are you tonight? Where are you tonight with this? Do you need Jesus to make a way for you like he has already done? Have you realized tonight that you can do absolutely nothing to get back into a relationship with your father except by believing in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? I cannot preach a message of God's grace without preaching a message of repentance. We must repent of our sins and we must turn to Jesus if we were to ever taste community with our Father again. So you have a choice tonight. You have a choice tonight as the band gets ready to to come up here. Um, They're going to play a few songs of invitation. You have a choice tonight to walk out the same as you walked in here. That that, that option is absolutely, absolutely available to you. You can choose that option tonight. Or you can walk out here knowing that you are a new creation, praising God for his son. And just like the question I asked earlier, celebrating Jesus 
for what he did on the cross and rising again three days later. That's your choice tonight. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be down here at the front as the band gets ready to uh, play. Um, I just ask that you deal with, with how God is speaking to you tonight. If that's up here, then so be it. If it's at your seat, then so be it. Um, but just deal with God and uh, let me pray. Father God, we, just, uh, we thank you, Lord, for, for your son, for the sacrifice that he made on, this, on the cross. God, I wish I could put it into words to convey um, how grateful I am. God, I thank you that I don't have to cover up myself to make myself look pretty, but I can come to you as I am. All my sin, all my disgustingness, and God, you wash me clean. You wash me clean by the blood of the Lamb. God, I ask tonight, the people that are in here, Lord, that you would just deal with them. God, that that you would speak to them. And God, I just thank you for for what you've done in here this evening, God, and what you're going to do in our lives as we leave here. Lord Jesus, we we love you and we thank you for, for, for your death and for your resurrection. Amen.